This uh, video lecture will deal with uh, a case study on uh, Romanian politics since 1990. Right. So let's review what we know about Romanian politics since uh, well, in that early 1990. Right. This is immediately after the revolution that we have discussed in 1989, uh, when uh, and after a long period of a, of a brutal, I mean, severe um, uh, dictatorship uh, under Ceausescu during communism. Right. And we all remember that in 1999 you had these uh, genuine popular uprising, especially in the big urban centers and in the west part of the of the country, former uh, province of Transylvania, and in uh, urban urban uh, centers in the rest of the country. But in most of the country, the revolution will actually be experienced on TV because what happens in Bucharest is that the TV station becomes the headquarters of the revolution, the visible headquarters of the revolution, where a group of people appear that. Uh, will take sort of the reign of authority, the reign of government. And these people will form themselves into the, uh, they will call themselves the National uh, Salvation Front, right? It's a sort of a umbrella group that everybody who's against Ceausescu. Now, if this name, uh, if this idea that we're, let's get all together under this big uh, anti-regime umbrella and then uh, you know, oppose it sounds familiar, uh, then good. If not, it will in a second. Uh, because what happens in the early 1990s is that, first of all, let's uh, clarify who are in this uh, uh, umbrella group, right? Well, as I mentioned, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, uh, many of these will be second, third ranking communist, uh, you know, members of Communist Party, who were the only group that was organized enough to do so, to appear and to step into this void of power, had the connections, had the networks, had the names, they were known, right? But they appeared on TV and everybody was told that, oh, this is whoever it is, Yoni Lies, well, who is Yoni Lies, right? Uh, clearly there was a network that was, that was uh, you know, sort of a reformist communist, right? And in fact, Yoni Lies, one of his first words were, or one of his first speeches were about communism with a human face, right? That's you know, 30 years after 1968, he's talking about communism with the human face. So clearly he was sort of a reformist communist at this point, right? He's forced then to change his rhetoric, right? And in, of course, immediately after 1989, you actually have democracy in uh, Romania, uh, you know, uh, and ever since. Uh, but a democracy with many problems, right? So when you discussed about transition, I don't want, I didn't, I wouldn't want you to get the wrong impression that, for example, Romania and Bulgaria didn't have the democracy. Especially in Romania, there was you know, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of what you want, right? But not a functioning democracy because the forces in power used the, this power, used the, their control of the state to uh, well uh, to benefit, to profit from it materially and politically. Okay, and then that thus delaying the actual transition, both political, both economic, and so on. So that's that's the, that's the that's what we need to, to understand here. Okay, so you have this National Salvation Front. Uh, the heart of it, well, uh, 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 the most organized part of it was this group of reforms, reformist communists who come as the revolutionary democrats. And slowly but surely they push out the others from the uh, National uh, Salvation uh, Front, the true dissidents who they incorporated at first because these were the known names uh, not many of them, but they were known by the population, they pushed them out. Now, if this sounds familiar now, it should be, because it might remind you of the communist takeover strategies from after World War II, right? When the communists will be part of a grand union, national salvation, front, unity, whatever, the government, and then slowly will push out the other forces. Well, there's something similar happened here, actually. Um, but not with the same outcomes, thankfully. Um, uh, but, uh, why not have other for political forces? Well, again, we have to remember that uh, what kind of communism the Romania did have, right? Uh, the, 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 the brutal, uh, harsh dictatorship of Ceausescu. The fact that you didn't have uh, civil society, not, not even as much as the Czech Republic, right? Uh, let alone Poland or Hungary, right? It's because of this brutal sort of um, uh, repression. Uh, so, so nobody's prepared to form, uh, right, a, plurals, a pluralistic society, a society with multiple ideological options and parties. And we've seen in all the other countries of, in the countries of Central Europe, that not even in those countries that had a civil society in communism, 
still those groups, no matter how developed they were, still those groups would, would not survive transition. Think of Hungary with MDF and SDS and so on. Right? So, uh, but Romania didn't have any, not even that much. Okay, so who will form as alternatives? So the, one of the first important parties that will form as part of this transition from one party to multi-party will be the historical parties. Remember, this is one of the sources of party formation in 1990, in the early 1990s in all these countries. You will have several sources out of which parties can form. Uh, one of them is the historical party, meaning pre-communism era parties. In Romania, they will be the major other alternatives that will form, namely the Peasants' Party, uh, the, the PNTCD is the, the acronym in uh, Romania, was, uh, and the National Liberal Party, both of which were the huge governmental, uh, well, the, the major parties in the interwar period in Romania. They will form, right, because they had the people who had been members of parties and the party leaders then, so or obviously old now or coming back from the diaspora, from abroad, but they will have the skills and the knowledge of what does it mean to be a party, what does it mean to have a party in the, in the multi-party system. I mean, all, of this, all of these are skills that need to be learned. And as we've seen in the other countries, the fact that you were an opposition member during communism doesn't mean that you will have the skills to be part of a democratic multi-party system. Those are completely different skills. right? Just like winning an election is not the same as governing. These are different skills, and skills that have to be learned like any skill, right? And learned by the political elite, but also learned by the population. What does it mean to have this alternation in power, and so on? And part of this, um, part of this, uh, lead, uh, you know, part of this is also the reason um, why uh, the National Salvation Front (FSN), uh, we led by Ion Iliescu, this uh, you know second, third ranking. Uh, reform communist, um, will actually sweep the first elections in 1990, May 1990. Elections that will be both for president, for the president, presidential position and for the parliament. And they will sweep these elections because uh, of what I just mentioned, right? They came in as the, saved the well, saviors, on TV at least, right? As the alternative, they, they were the revolution for many of people in the country who participated in the revolution by watching the TV, the state TV station. They took, power, they, they took over power, right? They became a political party immediately because they had the skills, right? They stopped the other parties from competing, especially the most threatening ones, these historical parties, uh, by simply by having control of the media and, and just pushing rhetoric control of which media, of the state media. Because they, again, as I said, there was freedom, democracy, hundreds of newspapers and so on. But how deep do the duos penetrate? The most powerful tool of, of communication was the state-owned TV station, which was in their hands, and remained sort of a, an instrument of governance in a way. And, uh, and other things happened in between, we don't have time to, 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 to go uh, into detail, uh, including the fact that the elections will be uh, scheduled just a few months after the revolution. I mean, there's no time to create a democratic you know, environment of true competition. Remember the criteria of what makes a liberal democracy, right? Uh, one of them is free and fair elections, which includes the ability to campaign, to have access to the information of the different campaigns and all these things. We don't have time to build all, of, all that up or resources. This party, uh, the FSN, uh, the front, had had access to the tools of the public administration of the state to promote itself, right? And to uh, to, to, re to throw all kinds of uh, negative uh, messages towards the historical parties. Meanwhile, hundreds of other parties are formed, which you will see many of them in the election uh, results in 1990. Uh, I just left them in because it's, they're so interesting and, and, and even funny. You know, this explosion, this euphoria of the markets, everybody makes a party. Plus, in the first election uh, for the parliament in Romania, you, uh, there was based on a PR system, proportional representation, with no threshold. So basically, everybody could get into the parliament to, to exaggerate a little bit. And that's kind of what happened. Anyway, um, so, uh, but at the same time during these months, this, this first months of 1990, clearly, I mean, you know, I mean, you should ask, so what happened to those people who actually did the revolution, who, you know, in Timisoara, in Arad, in, uh, you know, Cluj, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Sibiu, in whatever, wherever it was, or even in Bucharest, right? 
um, who were on the street, who, who perceived, who know, who knew the difference, who, who had a more developed political, political you know, culture or consciousness, let's put it that way, maybe. Um, what happens with them, right? How do they respond to this? Well, they respond negatively, right? So immediately you will have a civil society forming against this sort of a takeover of power, and immediately they will be qualified as neo-communists, meaning the non-reformed ex-communists, or the actually ex-communists, actually communists, so which are just trying to appear as democrats. But the rhetoric on the ground was neo-communists. And, and that will be the... One of the major cleavages during the 90s, it will be the neo-communists or ex-communists or non-reformed communists or reformed, but actually still retrograde communists in the rhetoric of the opposition versus the opposition. And that will be, this is why the, the, the transition will be delayed. Because remember, in all the other countries we have studied, the Central three Central European countries we have studied up to now, discussed, uh, you will have the first election sweeping away completely the communists, including the reformed communists and the opposition coming to power. Well, in Romania, that won't happen. It will be the reformed communists who will hang on and grab the reins of power for six years, actually, for in 1990 elections first, but then after passing the constitution in the first constitutional new elections in 1992 as well, and it's only in 1996 that we will have that change that in the other three central European countries happened in 1990 when the opposition sweeps away the communists. So here I'm, I'm already talking about one of the major cleavage, one of the major cleavages in Romanian society uh, in the 1990s, which is basically the neo-communists versus the opposition or the opposition versus the neo-communists. Again, these weren't neo-communists as in new communists at all, right? They were sort of a reform communists, right? But the point was to, of the rhetoric was to point out that these were still the those people, right? The, we, we have not finished the, the thing. We haven't removed the remnants. And it didn't mean communism because, the, again, there was democracy, whatever, in all kinds of ways. But, um, what it meant that these were the forces that didn't want, didn't, weren't fully behind those three things that we have discussed as the common goals of transition. Uh, uh, democracy, free market, Europe. Right? In fact, uh, I requalified, uh, I posted a material on, on Canvas, which is a paper um, I wrote early uh, years ago, and I post an excerpt, which is for reference, you don't have to read it, but there I detail, actually go de explain all of these, all of these uh, things, and it takes, actually it focuses on the period from 96 to 2004. Uh, but I talk about cle these cleavages in Romanian society, so it's very helpful for that, uh, uh, but again it is for reference. Uh, it is up to your choice to, to, to start to look at it. Um, but I, these issues I will cover then, however, uh, uh, I will mention here, you have more information there in the, in the paper. Um, so, <clears throat> I requalify this cleavage actually in the paper by talking about the eastward versus westward leaning forces, right? And by eastward I mean this sort of a Byzantine, uh, but also uh, retrograde, also nostalgic, also more protectionist, also more, more statist, also more more, um, you know, less reform inclined, less keen on Europe, more let's keep relations with Russia. So kind of this sort of a harkening back to communism, but moving, but still, but in a democratic con context, sort of um, looking towards the past, not advancing towards the future. So in the local rhetoric, it was looking towards the East, because the alternatives as always in history for these countries were East versus West, was where the model of whatever it was, Ottoman Empire, Russia, USSR, versus the West, right? So these have been always kind of the, the tools, and um, uh, more or less. So in this case, they will form a cleavage because, um, the political cleavage, in the sense that there will be political forces that will clearly, will be more stagnant, more retrograde, more looking backwards, more, and, and tapping into some of the, you know, fears, nostalgia, or whatever, reluctance, not developed uh, democratic political culture of a part of a population, versus you have another part of the population, uh, which is more westward looking. We want all those things that we mentioned in Central East Asia, in Europe, in Central Europe, you know, democracy, full democracy, full free market, quick reforms, and back to Europe. That's the, 
I qualify as westward leaning, and there will be other uh, political, some political forces who will push in that direction, and they will address the part of the population that is shared this political culture. Now, as I'm going, uh, as I'm talking about this, um, uh, it takes us to. Um, to, a, to, a, to an aspect that we have discussed uh, uh, before several times. So this is the administrative map of Romania today, but here is the map of Romania today versus the three historical provinces that we have discussed when we examine, examine the, you know, the uh, birth of the state of Romania and so on. Transylvania, Moldova, and Valachia. Here is called Montenia, but it's Valachia basically. Uh, so, Transylvania. Now, now you you might, you have to make those connections, the connections with what we have discussed before, with the cultural, ethnic, political, administrative differences that have characterized Moldova and Wallachia versus Transylvania, right? And we have discussed that, right? That they have been characterized by different uh, by all these <coughs> differences, and they have formed a state in 1918 uh, and remained, you know, kind of in this uh, in this format. Uh, but these, you know, these differences do not go away. And when we discuss the revolution, I also mentioned these differences. And indeed, uh, these westward-leaning forces, not by chance, will have more success in this part of the country rather than in this part. And from this part of the country, it will be mostly in the m larger urban areas. Uh, so the cleavages, you know, will be overlapping. Actually, in, in uh, remember I distinguish between overlapping and cross-cutting cleavages will be mostly overlapping because you will have both westward leaning, uh, you know, uh, pro democratic reform, pro market, pro European Europe, European Union, um, anti communist, uh, also including the ethnic minorities. Um, what else should, should be mentioned? Urban, more educated, mostly from the west of Romania, versus mostly from the east more, or south of Romania, uh, uh, more nostalgic, more statist, uh, more less keen on reforms, more fearful about you know and uh, these you know democratic and uh, especially you know market reforms and so on. So this sort of a cultural divide will be reflected, although again, remember, with the idea, with, with the mention that, you know, the large, some of the larger um, urban places like Bucharest for, for sure, right, but also some other urban, um, 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 uh, you know, centers from these other regions, you will have sort of this westward leaning, you know, outlook as well. But, you know, eastward leaning, uh, more, uh, you know, remember, these were part of that tradition that, that, uh, of a culture that was influenced by, you know, the Byzantine, more authoritarian, whatever, uh, rule uh, in history, but, and, and, but also mostly the rural population, the, 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 the workers, the, the rurals, the less educated, uh, older, right? And that would be the eastward looking. So younger, more urban, mostly from the west, older, more uh, uh, rural, uh, uh, lower educated and mostly from the east and south, these will be cleavages which will be reflected in every single election. And of course, it's not unidimensional. You'll see the maps because I posted some maps of elections even up to the 2000s, and you will see that you know it's, a, it's more of a patchwork and they, they're kind of fading, fading away now actually because uh, it's more complex and also because the political life is much more. But uh, in general, you will have these sort of, uh, in the nineties for sure, you will have this sort of a eastward looking versus westward looking, um, appealing to different categories in the population, but the eastward looking appealing to a larger strata in the population because automatically those who are lesser educated, rural, whatever, um, or at least, you know, um, uh, blue color, whatever, will be more in this, in this society at this point. The, the, the number will be large. So that's, that's one of the, 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 the major uh, uh, cleavages. Another important cleavage in the, in the 1990s will be the, um, well, not necessarily an ethnic cleavage, but a cleavage related to ethnic issues, right? Now remember that Romania, right, has a large, uh, has many ethnic minorities, and especially two large ones, one is the ethnic Hungarians, and here you have a, a map of, uh, perhaps not the most telling map, but 
a map of ethnic minorities in Romania. This is not as, as expressive, these, these uh, you know, percentages, these pilax percentages, because it looks like it's everything in a sea of, of violet. But, you know, it's not as, it's not as easy to perceive the, the combination uh, of, of ethnicities, right? Um, uh, and where they're located. But anyway, it gives you a sense, perhaps, uh, what you see, however, you see that there are two counties in the heart of Romania, well, of Transylvania, in the part of Romania, that are overwhelming majority ethnic Hungarians, 85%, 74%, and then about 45% here or thereabouts, and also large percentages here. So in Transylvania, of course, because of the given history, the large percentage of Hungarians overall, about 1.6 million. There's another large ethnic minority which, however, has not had any impact politically, basically, which is the Roma population, probably about, we don't know how many, with, because of the problems of the Roma uh, gypsy population, um, um, uh, or Roma as, as the, it is preferred nowadays to be called, um, a large number, but because of their socioeconomic problems, their sort of his, uh, um, different, uh, different uh, um, barriers um, of access, basically the census is not clear uh, with how many they were, but the estimates are about probably larger than the, the ethnic Hungarian population, but much more widespread, much more widespread meaning everywhere and not in solid clusters, and not forming organized groups for civilization or so to speak, you know, sort of a cultural area. This is a clear cultural area where everybody speaks Hungarian, for example. Right? and they have their institutions, cultural, and, and so on and so on. So, you know, it is a Hungarian region, right? There is no Roma region, right? They live everywhere in the country, in different percentages, in di every single locality, every single, right? Uh, so it it's, it's, it's doesn't have, has not had an impact, but it's an important population. But then there are many other ethnic groups. There, historically, remember in Transylvania, you had three major ethnic groups, well, four, uh, in a way, uh, Roma uh, Romanian, Hungarian, German. Now, I'm saying four because in um, the Middle Ages, the Hungarians and the Seclers were considered, who are Hungarian speaking, but they were considered different ethnic groups. Doesn't matter. The point is now they consider themselves together. Um, then you have Serbians, Bulgarians, especially in this part. Again, Transylvania, multi ethnic, this less, although here you have Turkish, Tatar, and so on. This is a region that uh, well, mostly to the southeast and so on. But here you have, uh, in Transylvania, mostly Romanian, Hungarian, German, traditionally, in this region of Banat and Timisara is much more multi-ethnic, actually, more mixed. Because of the German exodus during the communism, which was a, there was a massive emigration of, of ethnic Germans from Romania, and the revolution happened in the first years, most of them actually left Romania after being there for centuries, I mean being here in, in this area for centuries, right, from since the early Middle Ages, all of them, most of them actually left for Germany where nobody has lived ever, <laughs> right, Germany didn't exist or, you know, but it, it's one of the great tragedies of, of sort of a, sort of a willing ethnic cleansing sort of a thing because nobody forced them out, you know, after communism, but they just left, right, because of the bad experience during communism and the fact that the communist regime in Romania was also a nationalist regime. Right? Less directly against Germans, more against Hungarians, but still oppressive. Um, so, but anyway, you have many ethnic groups, but especially the, the major ethnic group, because also it, it forms important clusters in Transylvania, including a lot, you know, I mean, in two counties, uh, an absolute majority, right? Uh, this is a major issue. And because of this legacy of nationalism, and a legacy of Remember the, the whole formation of Romania as a state, of this Romania as, as a state, in 1918 was the combination of these two provinces that were already Romania, incorporating Transylvania, which was multi-ethnic, after Transylvania having been either independent or associated with the Hungarian Kingdom forever, right? Uh, multi-ethnic and with a Romanian majority, of course, right? Um, so these tensions, you know, that the unification was done at the detriment of the, uh, you know, the, of the Hungarian state, and uh, beforehand the Hungarians, especially in the 19th century, because of the inept policies of uh, attempted assimilation of the Hungarian kingdom, you know, there have been huge resentments 
because it was felt that they were trying to erase Romanian national identity, which was being defined then. Uh, I mean, huge historical resentments, and then the fact that, you know, uh, which was just reinforced after, after uh, during communism by uh, uh, Ceausescu, who was both a communist and a nationalist. They don't go at, at all against each other, think Milosevic. Okay, so all of this makes, uh, in, after 1990, one of the other cleavages will be this sort of a anti-Hungarian, anti-ethnic minority um, uh, rhetoric versus a pro-Hungarian, pro-ethnic Hungarian, pro-ethnic pro minorities' rights rhetoric. And I'm, I'm broadening the sphere, it's not Hungarians versus Romanians because there are many elements of the civil society and many political parties that later who will pick up this idea of the ethnic rights, ethnic rights of ethnic communities for self-governance, for cultural rights and whatever. So it's not just one group versus the other. But there will be clearly ethnic tensions in, especially in Transylvania, right? Which, is, which by this time, because of the exodus of the Germans, will become almost, you know, uh, the cleavage will be very overlapping cleavages between Romanians who are also Orthodox and Hungarians who are Protestant or Catholic with different institutions. Remember the overlapping cleavages, they create divided societies. And it's, since there weren't any more three or four or five groups here, it became an either or situation. Not so in Banat, not so in Banat, and in this region where you have always had a multi ethnic society, an intercultural situation more like the Vienna one that we have discussed. This is why in the 1990s, you, early 1990, you will have tensions here, but not here. Okay, so you know, it's a very interesting case study because you know, multi ethnic societies do not equal conflict. Yeah? So anyway, you have, we have to keep this in mind because now we're going to talk about. So because uh, it, this will be another important uh, cleavage. It will be an important cleavage because political parties, political groups will operationalize, will use this rhetoric, this nationalistic rhetoric, to gain political points. And the, front, the National Front will either ally itself with extremist parties or itself will pick up this nationalistic rhetoric. Again, the, the bogey of Hungary is going to come and take us Transylvania, and which will work very well here, where no Hungarians live, right? Because, you know, it's always with the person you don't know that you're afraid of. Plus, there will be actual very significant tensions here. So, another cleavage um, that will be operationalized politically in the 90s will be uh, related to the ethnic Hungarian minority, uh, pro or against, sort of a sort of thing. Okay, now uh, let's step back here and now talk a little bit about the Romanian state and political system. So the Romanian state, uh, the way it is established after 1990, it is established surprisingly, right, or unsurprisingly, as a unitary state, right, as a unitary state and uh, you know, following on the tradition of communism as a centralized state, and also following on the French model. The French model of administration and politics will be the model that the Romanian uh, uh, police, the Romanian elites will follow. Uh, remember that we talked about <coughs> the other century the European countries which followed other models. Yeah? Um, but no, it's the French model that the Romanian elites prefer. It's a historical cultural affinity. Um, and that France, France has a centralized unitary, unitary centralized state, Romania will actually have the same thing. Which again is kind of counterintuitive, but in the sense that, well, since you have such, you know, you have this significant ethnic minority, wouldn't another uh, arrangement work better? But actually, it is also explains why unitary, because it's this keenness. If the Romanian state was formed to incorporate in different provinces, then maintaining statehood. Uh, is by further strengthening this unitary nature. Same actually happens in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom was formed through unifying, centralizing power away from, the, its, from its uh, components, Scotland, Wales, and so on, and England and uh, Ireland. Uh, so actually, to be conservative in the United Kingdom up to 1990s meant to centralize, to make, you know, United Kingdom, right? It's, maintaining this unitary nature. So it's nothing ex extraordinary about what is going on. It's just a process of, a continuation of the process of, of, of state building, right? Of reinforcing state building. It's also telling that the national uh, holiday, the national day of Romania is December 1st. It's coming up, right? Uh, 19, uh, because it harkens back to December 1st, 1918, which was the unification of these provinces, which were already Romania, with Transylvania. So if that is the, the heart of the 
meaning of the what is this uh, of, of what is the state right uh, uh, of, of establishing state of state building you see the why unitary and centralized but it creates many problems furthermore if you look at the constitution uh, the first part of the constitution that was posted on canvas you will see that it also makes reference to the fact that Romania is a nation state actually in Romania it's national state right but that's also a strange <laughs> thing to say because clearly Romania in political science terms is not a nation state because it's not only the state of one nation since factually there are many nations or national groups living there and saying that it's a nation state you even say that you are actually Romanian which clearly those population you know, Romanian citizens, yes, but clearly ethnically defined, as all these groups define themselves, for better or worse, they are now don't consider themselves ethnic Romanians, but Romanian citizens of different ethnicity. And that was actually the name in the, 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 the title in the, the communism. You were a city, Romanian citizen of different ethnicities. Anyway, so factually it is not a nation state, because it would be absurd to call it that it's the state of a nation, uh, or if you define it like that, then what do you do with these? Are they just guests? And that indeed is a rhetoric that the extremist parties use, that you're just guests here. As if they have arrived yesterday and are just passing by and buying you know, cigarettes at the kiosk at the corner. Um, so, you know, that's a tension, but it, it remains and the emphasis remains on and any attempt to change this or to, to address this is, is impossible uh, because any attempt is seen as an attempt to, as an attack in, to, to, on Romanian state, right? Romanian state that is the state of a nation, the state of the Romanian nation. That, but again, you see the conundrum that, that results from it. And um, you know, from a political science perspective, it's very <laughs> well. It's interesting. Um, okay, so that's the state. Uh, how about the political system? The political system, uh, the Romanian political system is uh, semi-presidential. Again, this is clearly the French model. The, it's based on a constitution that was written, it has been amended since, but has been written, was written in 1991. So basically written and composed by the National Salvation Front and its people. So it has a certain bent. The opposition back then opposed it fiercely, but it didn't go anywhere. So semi-presidential, which means what? Uh, well, as all semi-presidential systems, right? It has... Uh, uh, it both has a directly elected president and it has a prime minister and the cabinet uh, and the parliament. And the prime minister and the cabinet sort of... So is between these two uh, factors. So the, the, the parliament also uh, elected by the, the people, we're going to have to talk about this in a second. Uh, and by now you know that the conundrums of, um, we saw it in Poland, of the, of the semi-presidential system, right? The conundrum is what happens during the times of cohabitation, right? And that indeed will be the most important problem in Romanian politics in many ways in the, in the 2000s, not in the 1990s, in the 2000s. Uh, it, they will come from this conundrum of the semi-presidential system. Furthermore, with all the, you know, uh, wanting to create a very democratic political system, which would not lead back to communism, so nobody could take over power. They have fractured, just like in the US, by the way, they have fractured political power immensely. So they have created a very balanced political system. The problem with balanced political systems is that things if there is conflict between the entities, think of the stalemate between the President and the Congress in the US, nothing gets done. Nothing gets done because nobody has a stronger voice. They all depend on each other. And that's what they created here. So in France, the President has one, some clearly stronger policy making powers. For example, he, he can chair you know, government meetings and uh, introduce policies and whatever. Not in Romania. In Romania it's a weaker semi-presidential model. And it's, they made it weaker so that it's very balanced. But very balanced also means that nobody can take really the lead. So for example, the president uh, can... Uh, I mean, he's the only one who can nominate the prime minister to form a government after an election. Right? And he, it, has, it theoretically has to reflect the majority in the parliament. Now, 
The majority in the multi-party system is hard to achieve. The more fragmented the parliament, as we discussed, the, the more leeway the president has to nominate whoever he wants. On the other hand, the prime minister, once the president nominates someone to form a, a government, so the leader of one of these parties or whatever, the prime minister and the cabinet needs to receive a vote of confidence from the parliament, so it needs to have a majority here. So the prime minister, you know, if you have cohabitation, clearly the president has no, has no leeway. If you have cohabitation when there's a different party here and a different party here, clearly the president has to play along. On the other hand, the president has some important powers, and uh, if he has a very clear, very strong personality and a very clear you know, direction, he wants to do some big things, I'm saying all of these because that's what was going to happen in the 2000s, then he'll be in this irremediable conflict with the majority here and the prime minister, because they divide certain policy making functions, for example, foreign representation. You know, the president should represent the country, but you know, the prime minister also, you know, is in charge of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and so on. And you will have actual conflicts like who goes where <laughs> during cohabitation. Because the second thing that happened in the French case is that they learned to, to, to live with this, with this system and it's clear that during cohabitation the Prime Minister becomes the key policy maker and the President a secondary. Here, such a tradition has not developed. You see, it's a system, but every system, even if it's identical, in different political cultures the same exact type of system will work very differently. Nigeria, Brazil, both have presidential systems like the US that work completely differently. And they're both federal states by the way. They work completely differently, right? It's just because you set up this set of institutions doesn't mean it's going to work the same way. So anyway, this is a big number. Furthermore, you notice that it's a bicameral parliament. Then you're going to say, well, that makes sense, right? Probably the upper house is going to reflect, I don't know, maybe the different uh, ethnic groups, or, or why not, let's reflect the, 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 the historical provinces, since there are some cultural differences, even if they have been leveled a lot during communism, by communism, but also because of population, artificial po population moves from one part to the other, and so on. And they say, well, you know, maybe that's what it is. It's the different provinces. Actually, there are more than just three. There are sub provinces that Banat is different from Transylvania and Dobroja and Oltenia and whatever. They're different. Anyway, you could guess that. You could guess that all of your guesses would be wrong. Because to make it completely and utterly and wonderfully balanced, uh, the, the writers of the Constitution have created two houses, the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate, that is exactly, have exactly the same power, just like in the US, by the way, uh, exactly the same power, are elected at the same time, and are elected in the same way. They're not even different the elected, so they do represent larger or smaller districts, that's the only difference, and they're large. This one has about 380, or had, this, was, this one has about 100, and, I don't know, 20 something uh, or, or 50. Uh, we'll look at the numbers, it doesn't matter. The point is that it's large. It is large and elected at the same time. And both of them have the same powers, which means that the formation of a government depends on a majority in both houses. But since they're elected at the same time by the same method, they will get the same majorities, not one day. Yes, they will. <laughs> and that's going to be the, 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 the problem. I mean, the situation. There will always be a majority because it's the same election, basically. Only from larger or smaller districts. That's the basic difference, right? With some other minor differences. Otherwise, they have the same powers. They both have to take, pass laws. But again, they have the same majorities. They both have to pass a vote of confidence to approve the Prime Minister or a vote of no confidence to remove the Prime Minister and the Cabinet. The President cannot remove the Prime Minister and the Cabinet. Um, uh, only the, the parliament can. So it's a very balanced semi-presidential system which, which yes, you, you've guessed, it can create the potential of sterling. Still the most kind of prominent position here is the presidency. Everybody wants to be a president. He has both the prestige of the authority, it kind of has this, okay, I'm gonna kind of uh, the, uh, authority of uh, directing the country on paper. But again, that in case of unified government. In case of cohabitation, there's very little the president can do, and which is kind of normal because that's also what happens in in uh, in, uh, in France, right? But it will create many problems. However, so okay, so this is the um, um, political system, uh, executive and legislature. Let's talk about the judiciary very briefly. 
the judiciary, uh, again, on the kind of on the French model, it has, well, let's, let's talk about two or three things. One is there is a high court of cassation, and you have the link there, basically it's the highest appeal court, highest court of appeal in all cases, uh, civil, criminal, whatever. And then there's a constitutional court which is completely separate thing. And that's the, the court that judges on the, uh, the uh, decides on the constitutionality of laws both after they have been passed, so before they, uh, before they become law actually, the president can, or in different other institutions can ask them to do so, and also after they have been passed if other courts reference these things. But also the constitutional court has other important functions uh, which became relevant when things came to pass uh, to mediate between the different institutions of the, institutions of the system and to confirm certain decisions. For example, to confirm the decision of the parliament to suspend the president, um, to confirm the results of referenda. Right? The referendum is that sort of a vote by which the entire population is asked to say, uh, to give his decision on an issue. Referendums usually are, referenda or referendums are usually binding, meaning that once the population said yes, that has to become the law. But we'll see that the things happen in many ways. But that's a referendum, and the Constitutional Court kind of confirms the results of the referendum. So, in these systemic issues that the Romanian political system will encounter in the 2000s, the Constitutional Court will be called into action many times. Because the, in the 2000s, the, the, the functioning of the political um, system in Romania will be um, uh, defined by these institutional conflicts between this side and this side. But we'll get there. Okay, so that, that about the judiciary. One more thing about the judiciary is a, is a more recent institution uh, called uh, the National Anti-Corruption Direction, Directory or Direction, uh, or Department, whatever you want to call it, DNA. And I have posted many um, links to, to materials on, on this uh, agency, which has become very prominent in the last part of the 2010s and today, but we will talk about it when we get there. Okay, so that's about the political system. Let's go back then uh, to, uh, to elections. Um, uh, and back to, to uh, 1990. Um, so, uh, elections. So, how are these institutions elected? The president is elected on, on a single member district two ballot system, meaning that the district is the entire country, but the people vote in two rounds. Uh, you've seen this before, right? Uh, in the first round, all the candidates run, in the second, just the first two, so that whoever wins has a majority, right? Single member district two ballot. Uh, in the 1990 election, you don't need two ballots because the only less room is with 85% outrageously. And then, uh, what was characteristic for the Romanian system until the 2000s? Again, just to make it so wonderfully balanced, is that all these elections took place at the right the same time and for the same mandate. So all of these were elected for the same time uh, at, at the same time for the same length of mandate. Just again to balance it out. Um, so the parliament, uh, you have senate and the chamber of deputies. And again, I left here all the parties that ran, especially since there was no threshold in 1990, just to give you a sense of this euphoria of democracy and all these parties that form. Note that in the, up to the uh, late 2000s, this, the electoral system for, for the parliament was PR, proportional representation. First with no threshold, then with some threshold, and then with larger threshold. The, the, late, the latest threshold was 5%. Now this electoral system will change, so I'm, but I'm not gonna jump there. So it was PR, PR, what's the problem with PR? The, problem, the good part with PR is that it's proportional. The problem with PR is that if there isn't a threshold, it's fragmentation, uh, re re results in fragmentation, or, and the more important problem is that uh, is lacks accountability. Because what a party is proposing in a PR system, each party proposes a list of candidates for each district. Each district produces, let's say, 10 seats. So each party will propose a list of 10 people to fulfill those 10 seats and then each party will win as many of these seats as uh, the, the percentage of votes they have received. So party A will get 40% of this, 
votes in this district, then we'll get 40% of the seats that come from that district. That's what make it, makes it proportional that the percentage of votes is equal with the percentage of seats obtained, both in the district and national. It's nice that it's proportional, it's democratic, but on the other hand, there's little accountability because the party bosses who, right, the party hierarchy who, who decides who is on these lists, and it's closed proportional, which means that you can't modify that list. So this will lead to problems. This will lead to problems, uh, as you'll see, and to attempts to create more accountability. Because I'm voting for a party, but I don't know who those guys are, um, and how can I call them into account? Anyway, so that is, the, that is the electoral system. We'll talk about how it was changed, as much as we can make sense of that. Um, and I also posted materials on the electoral system. Okay, so <laughs> let's look at the, election, uh, the results in 1990. National Salvation Front, 67%. That is, again, outrageous. It, it tells you that it, this is, it's not in a time of crisis, but it's in a time of an undeveloped, basically, political culture. Four months after the revolution, country coming out of a severe dictatorship, how much of a party competition, democratic competition, can Okay, and then you have the second party, which has been a staple of politics in Romania since 1990, is the Democratic <coughs> Alliance of Hungarians in Romania. UDMR is the Romanian acronym, uh, DAHR English. This has been a party that has been very, very successful. Remember our uh, discussion of uh, the, the solutions to uh, you know multi-ethnic societies, right, in Central Eastern Europe, and one of the solutions was this self-governance idea, which can have many. Forms, right? Local self governance, cultural self governance, or representation in parliament. And this is it. The Hungarian, uh, the Hungarian actually, it's an alliance. So there are many Hungarian groups within the ethnic Hungarian uh, population. But they have been very politically mature from the beginning to form, to know that they need to act together for their common interest. So the Democratic Alliance of Hungarians in Romania has been very successful, especially until the mid 2000s. Uh, in speaking with one voice and attracting the almost literally the 90 something percent of the ethnic Hungarian vote. And that gave them a constant, solid presence in the parliament through the mechanism of democratic representation. In fact, here they're the second largest party. They're the second largest party in, in the parliament. Of course, at this point they were the enemies, right? Remember, nationalistic rhetoric runs today in the, in the 90s, early 90s, especially. Then you have the historical parties, the Liberal and the Peasants Party, and then you have all kinds of other parties. I mean, just look through the list, it is really nice. Now, uh, that's the Senate. Yes. Yes, indeed. And then you have the Chamber of Deputies. What I want to mention about the Chamber of Deputies is that also in this, <coughs> um, you know, um, awareness or uh, consciousness of that we need to set up a democratic system in the constitution uh, um, and the way the, the political system will be set up, the Chamber of Deputies um, uh, will have special provisions for other ethnic minorities. What do I mean by that? Uh, any group can form a political party and run in elections, but obviously at this point, you know, soon enough they will need to obtain a 5% threshold. That's not easy to obtain, right? There's millions of votes or, uh, that you need to get there. Uh, or at least hundreds and hundreds of thousands of votes, okay? So that's not easy and most of the other ethnic minorities are much smaller. But in this idea of democracy and of principle of self, uh, of, of representation, uh, the Romanian law will make a special provision that ethnic minorities have to, uh, if they want to be represented in the parliament, they will run in elections, they will have to run in elections, but they don't need to obtain not even the threshold, but they need to obtain a very small percentage of the minimum necessary to get one representative. So each representative in the parliament would normally be elected by this many uh, you know, citizens. If they obtain like a quarter of that, they get one seat. So let's simplify and say that there are reserved seats in parliament for ethnic minorities that of a certain consistency. So what you will see is from every single uh, election onward, 92 and onward, uh, will be that in the Chamber of Deputies you will have about 13 to 18, nowadays 18 ethnic minorities distinctly represented after each election, each with one seat. 
except for the Hungarians who run as a party and they obtain much more than that, not just one seat, because they run and actually get more than 5% and get some seats. So that's an interesting uh, and very nice uh, feature. So next elections are in 1992 under the new constitution. Still, things have not changed much. You know, again, it's democracy, but the forces in power, the front, uh, you know, it's still you know ruling, especially the rural east in the east, south, uh, less educated. We talked about those cleavages. Those cleavages are run by the are, are respond to the National Front and Union Liescu still while the opposition starts grouping itself into, anti, uh, uh, into, into an anti-communist, in fact, right? But anti-reform communist alliance under the name of the Romanian Democratic Convention, which is an alliance of the historical parties and others, the civic society. So what you have is basically opposition versus ex-communists. Well, does that sound familiar? Yes, it's that division that was there in Central Europe before 89, perpetuating itself in the 90s in Romania, and the only the the the, um, the time when this will uh, the change will happen, it will be 1996 elections. So this is that delayed political transition, that anti-communist civic forces that did not couldn't organize during communism form after communism, and fight the communists, quote unquote, or reform or ex-communists or now basically oligarchs people who benefited from the transition, local barons and so on, that's <laughs> corrupt and so on, and also less willing to do uh, reforms and uh, stagnating and uh, more eastward looking, more slower into change in all those directions, west, uh, I mean Europe and the market and democracy than, than the other forces, right, that division of westward versus eastward looking, well eastward is the front and westward is the National Democratic Convention. Two other things, important things happened actually early 1990, so I, I, I kind of jumped. Um, 1990, uh, early 1990, you have a very brutal conflict, street conflict in one of the cities in, in, in Transylvania, between, which is basically half half Hungarian and Romanian, street conflict between the locals in ethnic Hungarians and ethnic Romanians, which actually results in a, a two or three people even uh, dying street fights, and that's early March 1990. Now it's not clear how, what, why, um, there are many things that, go, that, that were going on. In any case, what we know is that was the, that was early 1990, and that was the moment when, uh, a moment when UNESCO feel, felt, and the front felt entitled to re-establish the sort of the secret, secret, uh, let's say, FBI, right? But based on what? On the previous Communist Secret Service, which was disbanded in 19, 19, 1989, right? Of course, right? They were the enemies, the secret police of the regime. But those structures don't necessarily just go away, and they're re-established with a new name, but mostly the same personnel at that point uh, in March 1990. So there are lots of suspicions about how these things happen. Another impo uh, important date is 1990 June, because uh, and then 1991, but 1990 June. After Iliescu and the Front wins the election in May in 1990, as I said, the, the young people, the, the, the urban people, whatever, the students and so on, they have been those who, who, who made the revolution. They, are, they remain on the streets throughout these months, and especially in Bucharest, they kind of made a marathon proud protest downtown for months, sleeping there in tents and protesting and against it, what they felt was this neo-communist retaking of the government. And the protest was withering away after the election and so on, but a nu the nucleus remained there. It was sort of this sort of a combination of you know Woodstock with uh, with with uh, folk song, with protest, with freedom, with democracy. It's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, but it, they tried to uh, the, the the government tried to remove them. They opposed it. There were some street 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 fights and. Ioni Liescu and his government invited, this is June 1990, invited, well, called and organized uh, the miners from one mining region of Romania. Remember that during communism you had these huge industrial platforms employing thousands and thousands, up to 10, 20,000 people in one factory, imagine, or factory platform. And they invited these miners, right, uh, brought them in, organized their transports to come in and 
basically crush this opposition. And you're going to ask, why would they invite the miners and why not just send the police? Because, because it was after 1989. You can't send the police to shoot or to beat demonstrators after 1989, because that makes you the old regime, doesn't it? So you bring in another part of the society to do your bidding, right? Because that looks like a sort of, you know, one stable, one part of the society cleans up the other part of the society. That was, that's what happened, but it resulted in, clearly the security forces had a role here, because people also got arrested, not just beaten by the miners, people died, uh, people were in prison, I mean, it was, it was a brutal, it was a, it was a brutal thing, and it remains memorable that Yoni Lescu, the president at that point, comes to the balcony and thanks the miners for cleaning up the university square where this meeting was held. And this is very important because, you know, uh, people have accused Yoni Lescu of many things, including, you know, his role in 1989, but also clearly about this, where his hand is very clearly involved, and of his government. Uh, let alone the fact that in, a year later he will do the same thing and bring in, kind of bring in the miners to remove the prime minister, his own prime minister basically, who was kind of moving away from his control. Well, it's interesting because just recently, in the last month or so, uh, Yoni Lescu has been indicted by 25 years later by the by the procurator and by the you know the institutions of the judicial system in Romania for crimes against humanity because of his role then. I mean which is a huge thing because at that point you know obviously he could do that right to the protest of the popular of the obviously his opponents and obviously he couldn't have done that in other parts of Romania but in Bucharest which was kind of in between these things it was an urban center but also with a large sort of blue collar population so it was you know, you had both forces, the cleavage of eastward and westward fell in Bucharest, you know, kind of divided it, so to speak. But anyway, he brought these miners, so that's, that's, a, that's an important moment because, well, it, it came back to haunt him just recently. 1992, then, uh, you have this, um, uh, you notice that they do not get the majority, they do not get the, the majority um, of the, I mean, yes, wins, yes, but uh, in the parliament, so Ilyescu wins the presidency, but in the parliament, the, his party, the National Salvation Front, does not get the majority. Uh, by far, right? Only 30%, so huge, huge, huge decrease. And the National Convention gets, gets very good results, relatively speaking, 20%. You have a lot of fragmentation, but you also have some other parties that also will tell you something. You have a National Salvation Front, the Democratic National Salvation Front, what is this? Well, the Dem Democratic National Salvation Front, I just said they're later PSD. These are Iliescu's, what will later become the Reformed Social Democrats, but later. And this is a splinter from, uh, led by his former Prime Minister. Um, uh, the National Salvation, later the Democratic Party. So let's refer to them as the Social Democrats versus the Democratic Party. Both kind of a center left, but these are more ex-communists, these are more Reformed Social Democrats, kind of. Okay, that's pretty better. Then you have an alliance of the center-right opposition, you have the Democratic Alliance of Hungarians, as always, right? And then you have some fairly extremist parties, the Romania, Greater Romania Party, nationalistic, xenophobic, aiming to rebuild the Greater Romania, including other larger borders and other, other such things, Romania National Unity Party, mostly based in Transylvania, again, nationalistic, mostly anti-Hungarian, uh, then you have the Agrarian Party, then the Socialist Party of Labour, which are clearly left parties. So these will form a government so that the Democratic National Salvation Front, let's refer to them as the PSD, they will form a minority government with the support from these parties. And it was called, uh, called uh, uh, the Communist Pentagon, so to speak. Uh, and let me continue uh, with the second.